He manages national operations, strategy, and company growth as CEO for Dabble with a focus on expanding Dabble in new markets around the globe as well as securing funding and investment for the future growth. His enthusiasm for Dabble led him to approach the company about taking a leadership role in expanding Dabble and then took the reins in 2014. Jamal dabbles in ultra marathons, fiddle playing, camping, live music, and has proudly driven in a demolition derby. Please help me welcome Jamal Stewart. Well, good morning. Thank you for having me. I'd like to share a conversation that I have a lot, and maybe anybody who is in business has, um, you know, that, that takes place a lot. So, you know, bear with me a second. It kind of goes like this. It's like, hey, how are you? Oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Oh, how's business? Oh, man, we're crushing it. Oh, absolutely, we're killing it. The truth is, guys, honesty is a lot harder than it sounds. We want to present ourselves that we're, we're confident, we're strong, our businesses are growing, but sometimes the reality is a lot different. When thinking about what I was going to say this morning, I was really focused on the fact that as humans, we all lie or have lied, and we've all been lied to. And I'm not talking about these clear-cut black and white lies. I'm talking about that, that kind of self-deception the kind of lies and dishonesty that keep us from living our best lives. And honesty, mainly with ourselves. How many times have we told ourselves that we're just going to go out for one drink? (laughs) Fast forward the next morning, oh God, what was I thinking? You know, or just one Oreo. I've gone pretty deep in a sleeve, and at that point, you might as well just hide the evidence. And the best place to hide the evidence is in the stomach. So, you know, it's pretty easy. We get caught up in very easy, small lies. Now, these kind of lies, you know, are pretty harmless. They're, They're kind of expected, let's say, right? But, you know, they are the beginnings, the, 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 the shadow of why we struggle to live honest, truthful lives. So any um, recovering Catholics in the crowd? <coughs> Maybe a few. Well, for those of you that are, you might appreciate uh, these four words. Face-to-face confession. Anybody? Yeah? All right. So not everybody. It wasn't something that you had to do, but I was kind of a weird kid. Um, so for those of you not familiar with the holy sacrament of uh, reconciliation, uh, it, it dates back to the days of indulgences where people would literally straight up pay kind of a corrupt church, for the opportunity to be forgiven of their sins. Well, today, uh, in, you know, for modern Catholics, uh, starting as kids, we get the opportunity to go and confess our sins um, to a a very human priest. And, uh, you know, generally, it's uh, behind, you know, a dark screen. You kind of see the movies they present it as it's sort of like, you know, that. But there is an option, at least when I was growing up, you could go straight up, sit in front of this person, clear your chest. And uh, I, for whatever reason, thought that that made me more holy or I was more honest because I was willing to go face to face and I must not be lying. But, you know, the truth is I was picking, like cherry picking, the top five like venial sins that like a pious 12-year-old would would do. This involved uh, peeking over the shoulder of Joni Avis, you know, conveniently the smartest girl in sixth grade, uh, on a test. Um, this involved, you know, not saying my prayers before bed or, you know, skimping on my chores a little bit. More on that later. And, um, you know, generally, you'd get out of there, you'd feel pretty good, chest is pumped, and you got three Hail Marys and one Our Father. Boom, you're good, you're done. So, you know, that was sort of how honesty as a child growing up in a, a Catholic family um, you know, occurred. And it's something that, uh, you know, I'd say this idea that you could go in with an etch-a-sketch and start over, um, while a little bit weird, um, actually was, was, really, was really healthy as a way to realize that what we do in the past does not define who we are today. Now, whether or not you're, you know, actually harming people, this is a different story. Those kind of things that we do, you know, I think we all can agree there's certain actions that just aren't acceptable. Um, but there's a lot of things that, that over time we start to ex- accept. And the, the reality is not so much that 
we're really, you know, trying to, we have to change ourselves, that we have to be somebody that we're not. Um, the reality is that as we start to, you know, grow, we, we, it's not about changing. It's not about figuring out something else. It's about just being really honest with ourselves, where we are, checking ourselves, and figuring out how to show up day to day. So um, I, um, when I uh, was a, this, back to this 12-year-old kid, you know, face-to-face thing. Um, so, you know, I, I'd get out of there and, uh, you know, I think as a child, as a teenager, um, we would, uh, you know, these things start young, these, 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 these seeds of dishonesty. And I think unless we start to check ourselves and realize that in life, um, you know, the, the benefits of a truthful life um, really start to open up communication, really start to open up and, and align ourselves with other people who share the same experiences. Now, the reason I'm here today isn't to talk about necessarily my, my confessions and my skimping on chores, but there's one experience that was, had a really profound impact on me. And I had come home late from, um, from school, but uh, I'd watered my fair steer that morning. Fair steers, probably not a common thing for everybody, 4-H, uh, grew up on a farm. Uh, you raised these, these, these lovely livestock animals, and then you sold them for this really like, nice profit uh, come July every year. And I had come home late from uh, a, a baseball game or practice, I'm not sure, and it was a hot summer day, and I just was feeling kind of lazy. Um, I, I wasn't really wanting to carry two five-gallon buckets sloshing across the field um, over to the barn to you know, take care of Hampton, my fair steer. And so I, I lied to my dad, and I told my dad that I had, um, oh yeah, for sure. I think I even had gone outside, filled up some buckets a little bit to make the noise, and then I, I didn't finish the job. Um, so I went to bed, you know, feeling a little guilty, but, you know, I didn't, I figured Hampton would be fine. Well, I get there the next morning, walk out to the barn with the buckets, and Hampton is not in good shape. Um, I didn't know what was happening, tried to water, tried to feed him. Uh, ended up calling Doc Thompson, the, the local vet, and came out, and there just wasn't much that could be done. And uh, Hampton expired, and uh, I, I killed a living being, you know, that was, you know, also a very expensive loss for, you know, me as a 12-year-old kid. Um, but more, more so just the fact that something so simple that I could have easily done could, was, could have been prevented, but because I was okay and conditioned to think that, that dishonesty was acceptable, that I could just maybe, you know, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't, there wouldn't be a consequence. Um, you know, that, that, that had a real impact on me. And uh, I decided that, uh, you know, I'd, I'd try to never let that happen again, you know. And obviously, I thankfully not cure, killed any more um, livestock um, in my life. But I've killed a lot of other things by not being fully honest with what's going on in my life. As the CEO and chief dabbler at dabble.co, um, anybody heard of dabble in the room? Got a few dabblers? Anybody taken a dabble? We got one. We got a couple. All right. Um, I know my friend Eric's taking the scones class tonight. That's a hot one. Um, <laughs> London Tea House. They've been, they've been great. Jackie and the crew. Ginger, I think, teaches that one. She's great. Um, well, for those of you that, you know, hop on, have hopped on the site, you know, that's a, I think it's a pretty attractive site. I did a lot of work on the design and uh, worked really hard to build that site into, you know, something that I was, I was really proud of. Um, and uh, the truth behind what's happening with you know, any company, any startup, is sometimes very different than what you see on that pretty website, right? Um, I'm not sure where our slides are at because I kind of you know, jump around when I'm not perfect there. But this, this ploy that we play to convince ourselves that what we're doing is actually, you know, it's, it's because we don't want to get uncomfortable. We don't actually want to, you know, have... Other people, we want people to think we're good. We think, I put it out there. I, I make a really attractive website so that people think, and also will want to do business on my site. But it's, it's a different story when you actually get behind the, the kimono, if you will. And behind that kimono is, uh, at one point, a company that, uh, that started with a really simple idea. Dabble, at its core, exists to help you get out of your comfort zone, try something new, meet new people, and if you're someone who has a skill, to go share your skill, to list your passion. 
and uh, we help you monetize that. So we sell, help you sell tickets to your events. Uh, we take a small cut of each ticket, um, but the, the way that Dabble works for some folks is it helps them build up their brand and their following. Um, it takes out the middle work of selling tickets and dealing with you know, registrations and cancellation requests and you know, I can't get across town, can I get my money back? Dabble deals with all of that for our teachers on the platform. For those um, not teaching on the platform, for those taking classes, it's an opportunity to dabble without having to sign up for a four or a six week class. Um, and you can do so in, you know, for 20 or $30. It's not gonna break the bank. So the original founders of Dabble, sometimes I, I try to, you know, sometimes I hesitate to like acknowledge that I'm the adoptive father um, of Dabble. Um, but the, the, the reality is, is Jess and Aaron started this company in 2011 and they got it off and got it off to a great start. And uh, ultimately, the, um, the company, you know, scaled in Chicago and in Denver. And uh, beyond that, it, uh, they had trouble getting it to grow in other cities. And they'd raised a bit of money, uh, $450,000 was, uh, you know, not chump change for a startup. But uh, when you're trying to grow a marketplace, an, 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 a national marketplace, it's really, really takes a lot more than $450,000. And the founders were hesitant to take on capital. They were hesitant to take on, you know, more risk. And as such, um, the company kind of stalled out. Investors got impatient. They didn't want to keep putting money in. And without um, you know, money, things start to dry up. So in 2013, I had reached out to Aaron and Jess through Jess. Um, Jess's boyfriend and I went to college together. Very small world. And Mike had posted something on Facebook. I think this is being recorded on Facebook Live. Hello, everyone out there. Um, and um, I clicked on it and I thought, this was a great freaking idea. Like, that's awesome. Like, you can find cool stuff to do. You know, I was really into the idea of learning how to become an urban cooper. I, you know, I wanted to build a, a cooperage. Um, and cooperages are, you know, for those of you not aware, um, you know, the whiskey barrel makers, right? And uh, there wasn't an urban cooper in, in uh, St. Louis at the time. And there was a bunch of, you know, microbreweries popping up and wine stuff. And I thought it'd be a great idea. But I had no idea how to make uh, a whiskey barrel. So I went to, at the time, I think it was A and G, um, you know, Cooperage, A and K, AK Cooperage in Higby, Missouri. Now it's something else. They've been uh, bought by some really fancy uh, winery in, uh, in California. But I went there and I spent two days learning how, to, you know, the, sort of the process of becoming a cooper and realized this was <laughs> probably not a good career choice, but it was really fun. So that was good. I went, I learned that I didn't want to necessarily become a cooper. Um, but when I saw Dabble, I thought, oh man, here's a chance to, you know, I could use Dabble and I could find classes. And so I had this idea for a project here in St. Louis called Skill City. I was going to grab a nice old building, renovate it, and turn it into a makerspace um, with the idea of bringing people together for classes, workshops, experiences. And that was, that was the idea. Um, and Dabble entered my world through a click on a Facebook post, and now I had a way to market what would be Skill City. So I reached out to the founders, got excited about the idea of bringing Dabble to St. Louis, and Aaron and Jess said, you know, thanks, we'll talk to you about it maybe a little later, you know. So bought a couple months, came back. I had talked about a franchise opportunity. I was willing to pay, you know, money for the opportunity to be involved with Dabble. Um, thank goodness that did not happen. Um, Twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars. I think I'd, I'd offered them. They said thanks, but no thanks. Very kind of them because I think they could have used the money at the time. Um, hi, mom, and uh, she just walked in. <laughs> um, but uh, the the idea that Dabble, um, you know, could continue growing without money was was a challenge. And so in September 2013, uh, Dabble laid off their entire staff. Um, in doing so, um, they had to, you know, face that really difficult decision of what are we going to do with this business that we've created? There were still thousands of people visiting the site, tens of thousands of people visiting the site every month. They were selling tickets. They had business. They had partners. How do we tell our partners that our business is struggling? And so I encourage you to check this site out. It's still up today. Aaron and Jess um, started 30daysofhonesty.com. 
And 30 Days of Honesty was something that was kind of based on this couple from New York City who did 40 Days of Honesty um, related to their dating life. They were going to just be really brutally honest about their dating experience. Um, and no holds barred. But the rule, I think, was was that the, the couple couldn't read the other person's post during the time that they were dating. But it was sort of like, hey, I don't know if I want to date this guy. Blah, blah, blah. So that was the inspiration for 30 Days of Honesty. And Aaron and Jess asked themselves a question and the topic every day throughout this period. And at the end of it, you know, the, the goal was at the end of 30 days, they were going to come up with a solution or a plan for what was, uh, what was to be, um, what was to come of Dabble. And uh, they decided to keep it going, uh, but to kind of change some things about the business model. Um, so anyways, that was the, the result of their honesty. And as a result, the community of Dabble, um, partners, customers really stepped up. They really got into the fact that, hey, wait a second, we don't want Dabble to go away. Um, and uh, it kind of got a new life and, you know, it started growing again a little bit. But they were still out of money. They still hadn't paid themselves in a long time. Um, the investors still weren't interested. So I was still interested, though, for some reason. And uh, I reached out again in January. And thanks to the support of St. Louis Arch Grants, um, we decided to apply for uh, an Arch Grant, $50,000 non-dilutive um, equity, uh, no equity grant. And working with Aaron, uh, we secured that grant. And in May 2014, got the, the you know, a notification that we were going to be an Arch Grant for that year. And I sort of raised my hand and had said, I, I'll, I'll, take, I'll step up. I'll, I'll, I'll take on this project. We had about $600,000 in convertible debt. So not really like a traditional debt, like you have to pay it back, but kind of you do eventually in the form of equity when it converts. Um, so I had $600,000 of debt. Sometimes I don't tell that other part about it not being like real debt. I say, oh, $600,000 in debt, just to make it sound like I was a little bit more intense. Uh, but we only had $10,000 in the bank. Um, and this $50,000 was meaningful. I, at the time, working here in St. Louis before I moved to Chicago, um, was working on some really fun projects. Uh, Eco Urban, Mission to Zero, What's Up Magazine. Um, and none of them were, you know, killing it. I thought dabble. Here's the, here's the my ticket to like a big, a big win. Um, so I took over as CEO in 2014 um, with the idea and hope and excitement of, of probably what the early founders had, what maybe many of you have had when you first stepped up and maybe took the reins of a project or an organization. So um, Dabble, um, I was able to, to raise some capital, which was you know really helpful. I was able to, after the help of Arch Grants, then I did Capital Innovators, um, and they really do a great job. Uh, nationally known uh, accelerator based here in St. Louis. $50,000, uh, they take a little equity, but really um, hone you, chisel you, sharpen you up, get you ready for, for you know, raising a real round. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find money here locally in St. Louis, but I was able to attract support and funding uh, from some of our uh, original investors in Chicago who were excited about the opportunity that Dabble would continue to grow. Um, with that um, initial checks, you know, it was like somebody wants to give me $25,000, oh, $50,000. Oh, all of a sudden, I had like a quarter million dollars committed to Dabble. And uh, I'd started to hire some folks part time. And those early hires were some of the most exciting because everyone's just so passionate and excited about the opportunity of working on this company, Dabble. They think it's just, you know, such a great idea. And, you know, you hire these folks $10, $15 an hour because you don't have a lot of money with the hope and the carrot that Dabble's going to grow into something pretty huge. Um, and we all really believe that. These early hires were, were friends. These were people that I, I, I consumed a lot of uh, of beer and coffee with and, uh, you know, dreams and sitting in cars late night after you go to drop somebody off and you're not ready to get out of the car because you're still talking about ideas and things that you can do to make the company grow and, and, and take off. Um, and uh, we ended up closing a round of $1.4 million. And at the time, I was like, that's, that's it. We've made it. We are going to do it. Um, now, I learned that really that $1.4 million was just the ticket to the dance. It was the opportunity to show up and be in the starting blocks. I was all dressed for prom, but I couldn't afford the limo. <laughs> I realized that I just didn't have enough money to continue to grow this thing. Um, but we decided to start hiring. So I grew my team of like four or five kind of friends who were, you know, pretty low wage folks, 
gave them C-suite titles, and then hired like 10 other people. <laughs> um, we didn't really have necessarily figured out all the business plan, but you know, having money was gonna make a big difference for us. Um, this was 2015, and uh, by early 2016, we'd closed the round and raised, this, uh, raised this, this extra money and hired this big team, but we still weren't that much closer, and I was burning through like $100,000 a month in cash for salaries and tech and design, and uh, ultimately, the, where I found myself back where the original founders were, you know, back running out of money and not sure if we were going to make it. Um, and I don't know if it's because I convinced myself that I couldn't fail um, because I, I didn't want to acknowledge the fact that maybe I had failed at some things. And the truth is, is that today, standing here, I am running a, a failing startup. I am massively in debt. I have taken on over $100,000 of credit card payments so that I could keep this dream alive. You know, prayer and a hope that Dabble will continue to grow and maybe someday I'll get that money back. And generally in my life, I've taken a lot of risks. I'm a, I'm a, I like to gamble. I like, uh, you know, none of, none of, not too much of that money that I lost when that I spent, went to gambling, I swear. Um, maybe like a couple thousand bucks. Because I was like, if I go spend 2,000, I could like pay off all the debt if I win big, right? Well, all these delusions and deception we tell ourselves. Um, uh, but the truth is, is that, you know, it's really difficult to scale a company. And it's really difficult to be honest with your staff when the bank account's running low and you, you're looking around. It's like, who's first to go? You know, when really at the end of the day, maybe I was the one that needed to go. Maybe I was the one who needed to change. And maybe somebody else could have done this. But I still believed in myself. I still believed in the idea. But... I had to acknowledge that maybe I was failing at something that other people from the outside, from what appears to be a successful company, is maybe not. Now we make five, six hundred thousand dollars a year. That's not, that's not, I want to be proud of that. I want to celebrate the fact that we are, you know, doing something pretty cool. But when your investors think that there's going to be like one or two extra zeros on that, it's difficult to kind of come to terms with reality that maybe it's, it's not going to be that big-ass company that I was hoping it would be. So, you know, I look back and I, I realize that I went from one project to the next in my, di- my days here in St. Louis. I got What's Up Magazine going and enjoyed the early, you know, kind of press and excitement of starting a nonprofit that helped out people experiencing homelessness. Uh, What's Up Magazine closed down in 2015, but back in 2002, I was this like bright-eyed washu kid. I'm going to go help the homeless, and we're going we're gonna to speak truth to power and all these like really exciting things. And just realized that uh, that, was, that was really a lot of fun. But as What's Up kind of got out of the limelight and it got harder and we were struggling with how to manage, you know, we were essentially giving homeless men and women a license to beg in some ways. We gave them a, a product and a magazine that I was very proud of, but ultimately it became a little bit of a nuisance in some of the areas of downtown where these our vendors were, were active. So I jumped over to Eco Urban, um, and Eco Urban, you know, hit the two thousand was a home building community of sustainable homes, and we ran into uh, the two thousand seven two thousand eight you know financial you know crisis, and the home markets just went to crap. And uh, then I jumped over to Mission to Zero before anybody knew that that had kind of struggled. And Mission to Zero was, you know, energy and waste auditing and consulting. And before that really failed, then I jumped to Dabble. You know, it's like never actually stopping to acknowledge that maybe I need to kind of reboot. And oftentimes it's all about branding and sort of how we present our, ourselves to others. Um, as kids, <laughs> you wouldn't think, you know, that we all start out. This is the, this, but this is where it starts as kids. We're told that, you know, we're, you know, not good enough to play, you know, kickball or something. So we get picked last. And all of a sudden we tell ourselves that we are, you know, not good at something. And I think at at times growing up, I think I just didn't want to be, you know, the failed kid. I didn't want, I always brought home straight A's, but ultimately I was maybe, you know, I was cheating. I was speaking over Joni Avis's shoulder, right? So these things as we grow into being adults, it's not so much about my fear of honesty, my fear of being transparent. It's my fear of what other people think about me. It's insecurity. So from kids, it's about pleasing our parents, being accepted. But as we grow older and we start to realize that maybe some projects that we're working on and building maybe aren't as successful as we hope they would be, 
sometimes it just comes down to, to being okay, being insecure, and, 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 and not always knowing um, the answers. Um, being able to just be compassionate with ourselves and give ourselves time to heal, give ourselves time to not jump to the next project always. Um, I think those are some things that uh, we, we have. But it comes down to this. It's just that we're afraid. That we're afraid of all of these things that maybe we're not good at. We're afraid of acknowledging that maybe that thing that we, we really were proud of, you know, isn't what it, we thought it was going to be. But ultimately, these are all just false signals of social conditioning of people telling us how we're supposed to present ourselves, how our LinkedIn profile is supposed to look, how we're supposed to, you know, wear things that look good and how, you know, just the way that we present ourselves. And it's just a lot of false evidence and it's not real. Um, And I think what it comes down to and what I'm learning through this process is that honesty is, is, in the, in the biggest picture, and what I, I, I hope maybe in your own lives, where you are struggling with sort of being honest or transparent or, or just owning something that you're struggling with, is just that the self-deception is not your fault. Self-deception has come and been conditioned from a very early age. But telling stories where you acknowledge that you failed and connecting with other people in similar situations um, and finding opportunities to just connect with a shared humanity that is uh, the, this, this life that we have. And startups, uh, they take on a, a different a vibe as you, as you grow. And what you hear about in the news, you know, when it's not like Facebook or somebody like stealing your privacy or releasing 50 million, you know, accounts of information, uh, what you hear about is just, you know, these $50 million rounds and these $10 million rounds. And man, I am not anywhere close to raising a 10 or a $50 million round. I don't know where SoftBank is and I need that guy or gal's number. Um, and I'd like to get that money. But the truth is, is that those companies that we, we always hear these, we want to talk about what's, what's good. You know, there's actually a, a pretty interesting website that's, that's, you know, for us startup folks that are sort of wondering when the last day will be. Uh, it's called like Startup Graveyard. And you go and it like, it tells the story of why they failed. Uh, <laughs> Startup graveyard, yeah. And, you know, it's like companies that you didn't think would fail. So one of, um, a competitor of mine, Soch, S-O-S-H, um, was in the Bay Area. They'd raised like $60 million. Like, give me six, you know. I got this, you know. But they raised $60 million, had like a staff of like 60 or 70 people, maybe more. But they, and they had a beautiful app, beautiful website, and I mean, it was so good that I think the site's still up because it was like they want to like show that like, hey, we were a really good company back in the day. Uh, but Startup Graveyard is a, is a great place to go just to realize that like some of the best companies that you really thought were super successful died and they ran out of money and it's okay. It's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not the end of that person's life. They don't take away their birthday or something, right? Like you get, <laughs> you get to live on another day and, you know, this fear of just saying, wow. I, you know, there's not like a switch. I wish there was. I think I have to go to like Heroku and like delete app. I think that's how I would kill Dabble. I'm not sure. It's not, it's not like a, it's not a very like, it's not a very like, there's no like, you know, I don't know. You, you don't like power down the server, you know, it's, it really is kind of boring. You go delete app or you just like, cause I can't let it keep going if I, if I actually want to, you know, walk away from it because every day, like 3000 people jump on that site, you know, and that's, you know, that's decent traffic um, that maybe I should sell to somebody, right? So now I'm in this, this interesting space of trying to raise money, trying to, you know, figure out what to do with my life, trying to figure out how I'm going to pay that like $2,500 a month in credit cards that I, I have, trying to convince my girlfriend that I'm not a degenerate, um, <laughs> you know, that I, that I, have, I have plans and I, I really do want to continue building something interesting. I also don't want to give up on Dabble. I want to own it. I want, to, I want it to be successful. I want more people to get together in the community. I want more people to share their skills. Um, but until I'm willing to ask for help, is, it's, it's probably not going to get that much better. Um, I sent an email to one of our top teachers, and uh, Saya was super generous. Um, I don't know what she was doing up at 3.30 in the morning, um, but, you know, eh, 
<laughs> we all wake up. We all have different reasons. But I was really glad because it came in this morning at like 3.30 in the morning after I emailed her yesterday morning pretty early. And I asked her for help. I said, you know, because I, I, I had, we had like an image asset issue. Amazon Web Services, I'd like to blame them, but it really was us. We didn't turn on this provisioning thing. It was free. I don't know why we didn't do it. But a bunch of images got lost, and we had to go back and load them up. And this teacher was asking, hey, what's up here? Is there some kinks? Anything I can do to work around? And I, my initial email to her was, um, oh, hey, you know, image asset issue. You know, just load it up or send it over, and we'll take care of it for you. We'll take care of it for you. Guys, there's no will. There's nobody behind me. I make it sound like it. If you've ever reached out to Dabble for a customer service, you might have gotten an email from Jess or Isaac or Hannah. Um, eh, it's me. Yeah. The, uh, the chat feature on the website. Oh, yeah. Me too. Uh, the hotline. Uh, you know, it's ringing to me. I love it when someone's like, you know, I, I I'm, you know, has, a, has like a refund, you know, complaint or something. And they're like, you know, I need to speak with your supervisor. So, well, you should have been a little nicer to me to begin with. <laughs> um, and I think, honestly, it, it feels so like nice and light to like tell a room full of people about this because I've been keeping that to myself, to my girlfriend, to my close friends, you know, this entire time. Very, very few people know the truth about Dabble. Um, and all those people on Facebook Live, you now know too. Um, <laughs> hope none of my investors are watching. Um, anyways, um, the, the beauty of it all, though, is what it does is it gives permission for someone else in the room, for someone else out there that has heard this story, who understands that we're not always crushing it. We're not always good as humans. Business, personal life. I have, I'm divorced. I screwed up my marriage royally um, because I wasn't honest. And, and I never was able to own that and tell that to people because, you know, if people know that you're unfaithful or you cheated on your wife, like, why would someone want to date me, right? Why would someone give me a chance? Because, you know, once a cheater, always a cheater, right? So you hide these things and you hold things. But until you're willing to own it and just say, hey, I have failed in the past, And I want to learn from that, and I want to grow forward, and I want to welcome other people to share their stories and say, hey, what have you done to change your behavior? What have you done to make your life a little bit more easy? Because lies and dishonesty, you have to like remember what you said instead of having to just know what you said, right? You you don't have to go back and pretend that you, you know, actually whatever you said happened when if you just tell the truth, if you just own it, it's so much easier. So... Failed startups, failed marriages. Uh, what am I good at? I don't know. Um, <laughs> somebody thought I was good enough to show up here and talk. That's good. Um, I like to talk about my ultra marathons because, you know, people who run for a long, long distance. Um, basically, you should be maybe mildly impressed, but you should mostly just cons- check their mental health. <laughs> what are they running from? If there's not a bear in the woods, why would you run 50 miles? I, I don't get it. Um, and there's a lot of people. It's, it's interesting. I think people like to challenge themselves and put them through um, a lot of pain you know, and, and suffering to like, get a medal or something. That's not the medal. It's, it's just to know what to do it. And I think the reason I do it is because I really do enjoy pushing myself. But I'm pushing myself every day. And honestly, the weight of dishonesty and the weight of not owning that my company, that things are struggling, that I don't know where my next payment check, checks come from. I haven't paid myself like since June. I mean, I drive Uber and Lyft. That's kind of weird. My car's out there. Anybody who needs a Lyft ride after this? I might be available. I teach knife throwing classes. I'm good at that. Um, it's really fun. You should try it sometime. It's like throwing like darts, but with 14-inch throwing knives. Pretty good stuff. And people pay you like 30 bucks. Like, that's a lot. I can, I can do one dabble class or I can like drive my car around, my poor little Subaru, for hours. Um, I don't know where I am on these slides. But uh, you, you do have to get, yeah, here we are. You got to get to a point where the actions of others don't change how you behave and how you think of yourself. You know, these, these, these really unintelligent things. If, if someone doesn't like you, all right, there's like, I think, seven point something billion other people that might. You know, if that person doesn't want to date you, guess what? There's a lot of other people that could. Um, If your business is failing, there's a lot of other companies. There's a lot of jobs right now out there. You can go get a real job. Why do I am afraid of getting a real job? I don't know. It's like a badge of pride or I don't know what it is. It's a weird badge. I'll tell you, it doesn't pay for anything. I haven't had a W-2 paycheck from someone else other than myself 
in like way, way, way too long. I guess, you know, 1099s, I, I've worked for, you know, I've waited tables. Um, I think I got a W-2 at some point for that like 213 an hour we used to get. That was pretty good, that was pretty good money. Um, I always know that I could go back and wait tables. I could turn my Lyft app on, I can throw knives, I can figure out a way to make ends meet. But I can't ask for help if I don't admit that I need help. We can't change our behavior. We can't open ourselves up to a new possibility unless we're willing to be honest. You know, we tell ourselves if we could just do X, things will be better. If we could just do this, then, you know, my life will change. Well, unless you put into that little block, if I cared more, if I actually wanted to do this, right, maybe then. You know, the reality is that nothing of, is, of these things are going to meaningfully change um, unless we're willing to, you know, actually acknowledge that we really do want to change. So here's some lessons that I, I feel like I've learned along the way. That the motivations for why we, we do things, why we run startups, why we run, you know, 100 miles or whatever we do, you know, they're not always the purest things. They're, they're sometimes what we can curate to put on an Instagram feed where we're, you know, cherry picking lies, you know, so that we can get through, you know, and make ourselves look good and be confident. And that's okay. Sometimes you need to, you know, convince yourself to do things you don't really want to do. But um, I also know that startups and being self-employed, how many of us are self-employed in the room? Quite a few. Yeah. God. I know, me and my mom, we, we commiserate a lot because, like, I don't know where the money's coming from. Um, and it's hard, and it's okay to be afraid. It's okay to be scared. It's really important that we create a safe space where it's okay to fail and own that and be welcoming to that and invite other people into that space. Have those difficult conversations. Invite other startup founders that you know or maybe struggling or... You know, just be honest with them. If you don't want to say, hey, it looks like you guys might be uh, struggling over there. I've been through certain things myself. You can just open up the conversation, start it, because a lot of people are so uncomfortable and afraid to admit that maybe they don't know what's going on and what the best answer is or how to do it or how they're going to pay their mortgage or how they're going to save their marriage. If you've been through those struggles, open up the space, create the space for honesty, truth, empathy, compassion, connection. Um, Knowing when to walk away. Sometimes things aren't always good. Sometimes it's time to give up. You only yourself can know when that time is. I think the answer for when it might be time for me to walk away from dabble is when I wake up and I'm not excited about the work that day. When I'm not really passionate about solving a small business owner's problem of filling their workshops and getting more people into their business. A big part of dabble isn't necessarily making money Telling, teaching people how to make scones, it's getting people into their business to become a lifelong customer, to build a connection and come back again and again. So, you know, sometimes though, if you're not happy and you don't want to wake up and make the scones, it might be time to stop making scones. Sharing these stories um, is really what is important, is building that compassion and that connection. And in closing, I, I don't know where this roller coaster is going to take me. I don't know why I continue to strap myself into it loop after loop after loop and not change behavior um, because I think it's going to work, because I'm afraid of giving up, because I'm afraid of acknowledging that maybe I didn't kick ass at this one thing. And really, I did kick ass at it. I did the best I could. I, I, I really worked hard. I continue to believe in what I'm doing. But I do know that ultimately the first step, the best first step is to be honest with those people around me that have supported me, loved me, and just given me hope um, for what I hope will be a really amazing life. And it's been an amazing life so far. If I walked out of here and got hit by a bus, I'll go down with a smile on my face. I hope someone else can figure out what to do with Dabble. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you.